Hi, my name is Anthony Avery. I'm an orthopedic surgeon at Ortho Virginia. Uh, my specialty is sports medicine, which is shoulder arthroscopy and hip arthroscopy and, and knee arthroscopy and minimally invasive surgeries like that. Um, I'm here today to talk about the rotator cuff. Uh, Ortho Virginia takes care of all kinds of orthopedic injuries, pretty much every type you can imagine. We have offices all over the state. I work out of the Arlington office and the McLean Tyson's office primarily. Um, but their offices all over. So if you have any questions or you are interested um, in different locations, go to our website at orthovirginia.com. Um, when I'm not doing orthopedic surgery, I enjoy hanging out with my wife and two kids. I have two little kids and I love playing little sports with them and teaching them how to read and write and, and color. Um, but so now on to the rotator cuff. So let me start with the anatomy of the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is a group of muscles around the shoulder. Uh, there are four muscles technically, but these muscles all converge to form a more or less common conjoined tendon as it attaches onto the shoulder joint. These muscles are located on your scapula. They're back in the back, underneath. Some of them are more in the front, but in general, a lot of them are located on the scapula, the shoulder blade, and they come out and attach on to the humerus, the shoulder bone that actually moves. And these muscles are responsible for all different types of motions of the shoulder, lifting the shoulder up and out. But these are really important muscles for reaching overhead and initiating movement. So any type of rotator cuff injury will definitely cause pain with pretty much every motion of the shoulder. They're very common injuries. We see these in older people, younger people, active people, inactive people. So they can happen in pretty much anybody, but the injury that we see is different depending on who we see it in. The injury that we see in a young weightlifter or a baseball thrower is, um, is gonna be different than somebody that we see, an injury that we see in a, an 80 year old, uh, you know, inactive person. Um, but they both can have the injuries. They both look very similar. They're oftentimes treated very similarly, um, but very different injuries. So I wanna talk about what a rotator cuff injury is first so that you guys can understand what it is so why we treat it the way we treat it so this is my picture of the shoulder we got the model here this is this is part of the shoulder blade you can't see the shoulder blade out here but this is the ball and socket of the shoulder and then above your shoulder if you press on the top of your shoulder you'll feel some hard bones that's not your shoulder joint so much that's this up here called the clavicle and the acromion which form the acromioclavicular joint so you've got the ball and socket glenohumeral joint, and then the acromioclavicular joint above. And this space in the middle, this is where the rotator cuff is. So the rotator cuff comes in and attaches onto here. The muscle portion is back here. And then this is all the tendon portion. This is the thick tendon that forms the rotator cuff. So this is a conjoined tendon of multiple different muscles that come and attach into one general tendon that then forms the rotator cuff. So what oftentimes will happen is this is where the damage occurs. Not so much back here. Some people will get some sore muscles and tightness back in the muscle region, but most of the damage occurs out in the tendon portion. So in general, what tends to happen is people will start to get, and I, I'm generalizing here, but people tend to get bad posture. So what'll happen is when you slouch forward, your scapula will rotate forward. Your shoulder blade rotates forward. When that rotates forward, that causes this bone to go down. When you pull your shoulders back, this bone goes up. So oftentimes you'll see people that will have less than ideal posture. They'll start slouching. They're type at a computer a lot. And that'll start to then irritate the rotator cuff. When it irritates the rotator cuff, then the rotator cuff will swell, so that'll get bigger. When that swells, then it can irritate this thing up top called a bursa. So you may hear of shoulder bursitis, and that's what shoulder bursitis is. When this space gets narrowed, it rubs on everything, irritating the cuff and irritating the bursa, and then everything just becomes swollen, which then makes the problem worse, because now everything rubs even more. And so this is, in a, in a nutshell, this is how a lot of shoulder problems begin because 
over time, this rubbing and rubbing and rubbing can cause it to actually tear through the rotator cuff. And then if people have a, a phenomenon like this going on, and then they're out playing a lot of tennis or they're lifting a lot of weights, then that fragile rotator cuff over time can start to tear. So the, the key to understanding the rotator cuff is it's not usually a traumatic injury. Most people that have rotator cuff problems and rotator cuff injuries don't have an, a, like a major injury to associate with it. It's, it's usually something that's been brewing for some time. And then that one day that they were lifting weights or that one day that they, they were you know, uh, carrying a heavy box, that was the strain. That was kind of the, the final straw that broke the camel's back. But it's not, the, uh, uh, it's not a one-time injury typically. All right, so how do we prevent rotator cuff injuries. Oh, and to go back, back to the, the mechanism of the injury, sometimes it is a traumatic injury. In a young person, sometimes you will see somebody who's tackled playing football or uh, rock climbers or who fall funny, um, and they can have a major traumatic injury that just rips it. So that is still possible, but the overall majority of people, that's not how it usually happens. So um, how do we prevent rotator cuff injuries? Well, first of all, if you're lifting weights and you're an athlete, you just tone down the weight a little bit. The activities are great. Playing golf, playing sports, throwing a ball, lifting weights, those are all great things, but it's the intensity, the high intensity. So drop your weight a little bit when you're lifting weights, especially overhead activities like a military press or shoulder presses, drop the weight a little bit. Those activities are good, but take it easy on the shoulders. The next thing is gonna be mechanics. When you're lifting weights or you're carrying heavy boxes, you got to have good good mechanics of your shoulder. Don't be slouching. Um, you know, don't be doing everything with one arm. Get help. Use two hands. You know, don't be reaching. Another common reason we see this is for reaching reaching for your purse or reaching for your bag out of the, the passenger seat. So instead of reaching and using bad mechanics to kind of pull this big suitcase of a purse over, turn your shoulders. If you just kind of turn your shoulders a little bit, then reach for the purse. It's just much better mechanics for your shoulder. But then by far and away, the most important way to prevent a rotator cuff tear is posture. Um, without a doubt, we see more rotator, I don't know, I see more rotator cuff injuries that are associated with desk jobs than anything else. Um, if you have bad posture, you're going to slouch a little bit, especially using a computer. That's probably the worst. But also sitting on the couch when you, when you kind of cuddle up on a couch watching Netflix every night. You're, you're still sitting in that kind of slouched in posture. So try to maybe put a pillow behind your back or something just to give a little arch to your shoulders. Either way, when you have bad posture, that acromion goes down, it rubs on the rotator cuff and it causes shoulder inflammation. And then when you go to the gym, you'll flare up that inflammation and then you'll come to the doctor and say, oh, I hurt my shoulder working out. I hurt my shoulder playing tennis. When that's not the truth. You hurt your shoulder at your day job, typing on a computer for 10 hours a day. That's what hurt your shoulder. It was the tennis that brought it out of hibernation. It was the, the working out that made it hurt. But the damage was done 10 hours earlier behind the desk. So how do we treat the rotator cuff now? There's obviously a lot of treatments and a lot of this is very um, debatable depending on who you see. Some people have different opinions as to what works best. And everybody's formula is gonna be different. Some things will work great for somebody and not other people. So we cater it accordingly, depending on who we're talking to, but just to list them all. So first, the, in my opinion, probably the best treatment is physical therapy and chiropractic treatment, things that can work on your posture. Again, I believe that the posture is a huge reason for this. So you work on the posture and a lot of these will go away without surgery. So. Uh, chiropractic and, and physical therapy treatment is aimed at scapular strengthening, pulling the shoulders back, sticking the chest out, getting your neck up straight. Um, you should also ask your therapist uh, about your desk position, your ergonomic position. Uh, that plays a huge part. If your keyboard's too low or too high, it throws off your shoulders. It throws off everything. So you really need to look at your workspace. This has been a huge problem ever since coronavirus with people working from home because they're not on adjustable chairs. They're working on some, you know, a kitchen chair or, you know, some old desk chair that they've had forever. Their desk doesn't go up and down. There's a lot of variables that you have on these uh, work desks that you don't have at home. So please look at your home work situation. So usually that's the first step. 
figure out your home workstation or your workstation and then send people to therapy to work on on their uh their posture and their scapular strength that's easy first step for pretty much everybody next is something like a massage massage works on it as well very similar fashion they help loosen up the muscles to give you better posture uh, anti-inflammatories like advil motrin aleve ibuprofen diclofenac mobic all these ibuprofen or all these uh, anti-inflammatories are very good medicines because they help bring down the inflammation when this gets swollen up here it fills up the space. So if you take these anti-inflammatories, the thickness goes down and you don't impinge as much. You won't have as much uh, rubbing. So the anti-inflammatories definitely play a good role. Next is going to be a stronger version, which is the cortisone shot, the steroid injection. Cortisone goes up into the space up here and the medicine is a potent anti-inflammatory. So having that medicine up there brings the swelling down. Again, opening up that space. So you can get the space to open up by therapy to pull your shoulders back and then cortisone to bring down the swelling. And then those are usually the best treatments, some mixture of those. If that doesn't work, then usually with my patients, everybody, everybody practices a little bit differently, but usually after you failed some degree of that, then I move to an MRI. The MRI is an image that shows the details. It shows all the all the anatomy within the shoulder, the labrum, it shows the, the bones, the cartilage, it shows everything. Ultrasound can work too, but the ultrasound doesn't show as much detail. So it's not wrong to get an ultrasound, but the MRI definitely shows a little bit more detail. Um, and then based off of that, we treat you surgically or we go back to non-surgical treatment. So if we find that the MRI doesn't show a major tear, it's just a little tiny tear, a little something, you know, we can treat that with another cortisone shot or another trip to physical therapy or a chiropractor. Um, and, and that usually can, can, can fix that. But if it's pretty severe, then we consider surgical options. Before I move on to surgery, there's another question I always get asked. Should I rest it? Should I put it in a sling, doctor? And that is an absolute no. No, no, no. You do not want to put, if you injure your rotator cuff, you do not want to go into a sling and you do not want to completely rest it. A little rest never hurts anything. But you don't want to really rest it because then what will happen is you get weaker and weaker and weaker. If you put a sling on, your good posture turns into a slouched posture overnight. So over immobilization and, more, and too much rest is actually worse for the rotator cuff. I tell my patients, go to the gym. Go to the gym. Just don't lift a lot of weight. Lift light weights. Do very gentle weights. Do things that don't hurt. Work the other muscles that don't hurt. But don't, don't just sit around and wait for it to heal. That's the wrong approach to a rotator cuff. All right, so surgeries now. Sorry to take a detour there. So with the surgeries, there's a few different types of surgery. One is a decompression. So a decompression means that you do these in people that typically don't have big tears. They have little tiny tears or just some bad inflammation um, and they failed all the non-surgical things. Sometimes we do a decompression, which means you shave some of this bone out. You open up some of this bone by taking a little bit off. Just shave a little wafer out and then you clean up the bursa. Basically, you're trying to open the space up. Now, that does not really correct the entire problem though. So that's, in my opinion, uh, more of a Band-Aid type surgery, but it does work in some people. The most important thing that you need to do if you do that surgery is therapy afterwards, because if you don't fix the postural problem, it's only a matter of time before it comes back. So that's a, it's a good surgery for certain people for very mild problems that have failed everything, but it's only as good as the therapy that you do afterwards. Next is gonna be a repair. Um, a rotator cuff repair is where this is ripped off. If the rotator cuff is ripped off, then we wanna reattach it. So we put these little things called anchors. They're little suture anchors. They're these little tiny screws that go into the bone and attached to the screw are some stitches. So the screw goes in and then the stitches we use to wind around and tie knots into the tendon, and that secures it back down to the bone. These suture anchors are usually made out of plastic. Some dissolve and some don't dissolve, depending on the company. Um, and most of these surgeries nowadays are done arthroscopically. Arthroscopic means with a camera. Um, laparoscopic is a term that a lot of people use. That's, that's arthroscopic surgery of the belly, but arthro meaning joint, scopic meaning camera. So we're looking at it with a camera. So most of these surgeries, again, are done with a camera, minimally invasively through very small incisions. Um, every once in a while, something requires you to have to make a substantial incision to see or to, to do something special. 
but most, most everything we do nowadays is through the camera. That doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt and it doesn't mean it's not a long recovery. It just means that they're smaller incisions. Uh, it's still very painful surgery, very long recovery. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more in a little bit. So that's what we do for most of these tears. But then there's some massive tears. Every once in a while, someone's had a massive tear. It's been torn for years or the tendon has retracted all the way back because it's been torn so, so severely. Um, and sometimes these tears just are not amenable to repairing, to fixing. So in that case, we have other surgeries that we use. And uh, this is very specific to the type of problem that you may have, but we have cadaver grafts, meaning we take it from a human who died and donated their tissue, and we can replace the rotator cuff with that. We have xenografts, which are grafts that come from an animal, and we can use those to patch the rotator cuff. We have a, a replacement of the shoulder. You can put a whole new metal shoulder in. There's a new thing that just got approved in the United States where it's a balloon, a balloon that you inflate with uh, saline, and the balloon helps to cushion the shoulder. And that's more of a, a palliative care. That's not really a, a permanent fix. But again, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of technology in these massive tears. And the reason there are a lot of little options is because honestly, none of them are really great options. They work and they, 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 they're the best that we have, but none of them are, are, are perfect options. So that's why there are many of them. So if you do have a massive tear, you just have to ask your surgeon specifically which one he thinks or she thinks is the best for you. All right, so going back to the repair, because that's the most common surgery we do, a rotator cuff repair. It's a terrible, terrible surgery. It hurts, hurts more than most people expect. Uh, it's hard to sleep for a couple months afterwards. It's a long recovery, but in the end, they usually do well. They usually do well. It's a good, good outcome, but it's a long journey to get there. The rehab is usually broken up into three sections. So the first phase is the healing phase. The healing phase is where you just want this to heal. The, this, this rotator cuff doesn't have great blood supply. It's not the healthiest of tissue. You just want it to heal back. And so that's the rest phase where you're usually in a sling for the first six weeks or at least close to six weeks. And you're not really using the shoulder too much. The therapy is very limited, very simple therapy because the first six weeks are, are all about the healing. Then the second six weeks, phase two, is about getting the motion back. That's when we try to get your arm up. We try to get your arm back in front. We try to maximize our motion during the second phase without really trying to build too much strength because it's, it's healed, but it's not strong. So motion, but no major strengthening. And then phase three, which starts at about three months, that's when the tendon's pretty, pretty good, pretty good and healed. That's when we start the real th uh, the strengthening phase. And that's where you can build up the strength to get everything back, get your motion, get your function, get your activity back, get your life back. And that unfortunately can take a long time because it takes a long time to build strength. Anybody who goes to the gym, anybody who works out knows muscle doesn't just come instantaneously. It takes many, many months to build that. And so nothing's different when you're undergoing a, a recovery from surgery. So um, that's all I had in my talk. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them more specifically. If anything I might have breezed over, please let me know. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Avery. Why is the recovery so long and painful for the shoulder? <clears throat> All right. If for a couple of reasons. Number one is you have to immobilize a shoulder. And you, so you put people in a sling. And the shoulders get stiff. And putting people in a, a sling is the worst thing you could do when you're trying to prevent a stiff shoulder. But unfortunately, you need to do that to allow it to heal. So that first period in the sling causes a lot of the stiffness. It causes a lot of the weakness that we have to dig ourselves out of that hole down the road. So that's one problem is the immobilization period. It unfortunately, hurts you, um, but it's necessary. Number two, the shoulder is really hard to immobilize. It's not like a wrist. You break your wrist, you put it in a cast and it feels great. Um, you can't immobilize the shoulder. There's no, you can't really put a body cast on it. Those things don't really exist outside of cartoons. So you put them in a sling and you do the best, but it's still hard to roll around at night. It's hard to get dressed. It's hard to wipe yourself. It's hard to eat. And, and you end up you know, hurting it a hundred times a day. Uh, Sleeping is miserable because any little motion, any little turn causes a little pain and then you wake up. And then you wake up with this interpretation that, oh my God, I woke up because my pain was 10 out of 10. When really your pain probably wasn't 10 out of 10. It just, you couldn't go back to sleep because now you, it hurts. And we all know how sensitive we are going back to sleep after we've been woken up. 
But that's why I think it hurts so much. It's not so much that it's a 10 out of 10 pain for three months. It's a three out of 10 pain. But that three out of 10 is constant. It's always there. There's no getting it to really go away. And so it starts to make people kind of lose it. They, they, they haven't gotten a good night's sleep in, in two months. It's like having a newborn baby almost. So, so it, they interpret it sometimes it's such a horrible experience, but it's not just pain. It's, it's the whole experience that becomes very um, painful. <laughs> All right, thank you. What size do you consider a massive tear? All right, well, that's, that's actually been defined. They use it as a three centimeter retraction of the tear. So when the tear rips off, most tears, I'm gonna get closer. If the rotator cuff is like my fingers going around the ball, you know, it wraps around, it's a pretty big cuff. Most rotator cuff tears that we fix are one piece that rips off. One piece rips off and it's usually sitting right there. And our job is to sew it back down. That's the average tear. So if you have a tear that's ripped off and retracted all the way back, that's a massive tear. So it could be one section that's ripped off and retracted back, but any type of serious retraction, we consider a massive tear. And the reason we make that designation is because it's harder to pull it back. It's harder to reapproximate it. And when it does get pulled back, sometimes it's under a lot of tension and tension is not good for healing. So if it's under a lot of stretch, it may not heal as well. So also uh, um, massive tears, massive tears tend to be more chronic. So we make that designation to, to basically to, to classify tears that may not heal as well. Um, it's our nice way of saying that the surgical success rate may not be as good for this tear versus another tear, but you can still fix many massive tears, many massive tears. We can still repair. If we can't repair them, we can put graphs on them. So we do have options for them. Um, every once in a while, there's a tear that's just absolutely, absolutely. There's nothing you can do with it and you have to do a shoulder replacement, but those are relatively rare. All right. Thank you. Do small tears ever repair themselves? Or do you have them for the rest of your life? <laughs> That's very, very controversial. Um, I usually tell patients that the tears, if it's a full tear, then I'd say, no, it does not heal itself. A full tear is, is ripped off the bone and it's not gonna reattach. Unfortunately, that's, I think that's pretty, pretty non-controversial. Um, it's the partial tears. If you have a little piece of a tear, at, at what point do you, do you say it's not going to heal versus it's going to heal? I think there are a lot of factors that go into play here. One is the age of the patient, first of all. The age is critical because younger people have better ability to heal things. And younger people tend to have traumatic tears. The older you get, the less potential you have for healing in general, but also the more likely it's a chronic damaged tear. So if you have, a, you know, if I had a 25 year old baseball player who had a little rotator cuff tear, I'd probably say, hey, let's watch this, let's take care of it, maybe it can heal. But if I had a 75 year old person who, you know, plays tennis a lot, I think that's probably one that's likely not going to heal. Um, but, but the rotator cuff is famous, infamous, I guess I should say it's infamous for not healing. It has very poor blood supply. It does not heal well. So when in doubt, I think it's safe to assume most of these do not heal. Thank you. How can you tell if your pain is from a rotator cuff injury or arthritis? There's a lot of crossover because an arthritic shoulder is a shoulder that's worn out. This part's worn out. The joint surface where the ball and socket rub together, that's worn out. Now, as you get later in the disease of arthritis, everything wears out. So the rotator cuff will start to degenerate and everything. So unfortunately, there's a lot of overlap in the two Venn diagrams here. Um, but if you really wanted to say, what's the go-to, the, the, the test I use is motion, passive motion. So a person with arthritis, I move their shoulder out to the side like this, and I move the shoulder up and out. And then I turn it back to have them touch their back. Somebody with a rotator cuff that's injured oftentimes can do some of those motions. They may have problems with one of them or two of them. But you know, they still have decent motion in some of the directions. Whereas an arthritic person gets stiff. That's really the hallmark symptom of arthritis is stiffness. So once people lose their motion, it's usually globally lose their motion. You know, if it, again, if they just lose their motion in one direction, that could be a tendon issue. 
but if they're globally losing their range of motion in all directions, that's classically arthritis. But again, there's a lot of overlap. Thank you. Several people have asked, what is frozen shoulder and is it related to rotator cuffs? Yeah, it's, it's all related. That's a, that's a separate syndrome that can come from any inflammation in the shoulder. And that's another, that's a 20 minute talk in its own. That's a very complex talk, but I'll, just to run over that real quickly. When you get inflammation in your shoulder from a rotator cuff injury, from a tendonitis, from overuse, from arthritis, from anything, you get inflammation and then the inflammation will cause a reaction that causes scar tissue to form. And this happens in everybody, but for some reason, people with frozen shoulder get this explosion of, of inflammation and then an explosion of scar tissue. So they get a horribly stiff, horribly painful, and horribly useless arm. Um, thankfully, it goes away in almost everybody, but, uh, but, but it, it, that's a separate condition. But yes, it can come from rotator cuff tendonitis. Usually not a tear, though. Usually when you tear your rotator cuff, you don't get frozen shoulder. Most frozen shoulders are from smaller, low-grade injuries. Usually the injury that causes a frozen shoulder is not a surgical injury. It's just some, you know, some sleeping on it funny or overusing the shoulder. You got a little tendonitis and then two weeks later, you've got a frozen shoulder. It's a terrible thing to get, but um, luckily again, it goes away on its own. Thank you. If your shoulder hurts from a rotator cuff injury, does ice help? And if so, where do you put the ice? All right, ice and heat are, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big, always a big argument. Which one's better, ice and heat? Um, Typically, if things hurt, ice is good. Ice, ice modulates the pain receptors. It, it's, ice is good for pain. Um, so anytime you have a rotator cuff pain, ice can help. Heat can also work though, because a lot of the heat will help loosen the muscles up too. So if you put heat around the back or on the side, that can also help. But if you're gonna ice, I put the ice right where the pain is. Because again, the ice is meant to modulate your pain. So put it right where it hurts. Most rotator cuffs tend to hurt here, kind of on the outside of the shoulder. So I'd put the ice bag right there. If you're gonna go heat, I'd probably put the heat more around the back, more over the muscular portion where the muscles are of the rotator cuff. All right, we have several questions about injections. So do you recommend steroid injections for small or moderate tears? Are they a long-term solution? And how many are effective for pain relief? Sure, I use, uh, we call corticosteroid injections or cortisone injections. I use them in a lot of rotator cuff injuries. I find them to be very beneficial because like I said, it brings the swelling down, which is part of the pathology. It's part of the reason. Is a rotator cuff tear going to be cured by a cortisone shot? No, absolutely not. It's not a cortisone shot's never going to make a tear heal or anything like that, but it, it alleviates the inflammation, which is causing the symptoms a lot of times. So I use cortisone shots oftentimes in people who I do not think have a tear. If I suspect somebody has a legitimate rotator cuff tear, then I oftentimes will avoid the cortisone shots. Um, the caveat to this is somebody who's older, older people who have absolutely no intention of having surgery, no problem. I'll give them a cortisone shot. Um, but if you're a younger person and you have a significant rotator cuff tear, then I usually don't do the cortisone shot, but they do work. Um, it's just, you have to choose the right person, but they're not a long-term solution for everybody. Because some people may have a tear. So if you try a shot and you don't get a good response, I wouldn't do another one and another one and another one, another one. At some point I'd get an MRI and try to figure out why they're not responding. Um, but they, they are effective and, uh, and, and you just have to use them properly. You know, again, you know, unless somebody's, you know, I, I kind of said it already, but use them properly. Don't, don't be over injecting a young person without knowing what's inside first, but. Thank you. Is platelet rich plasma an option for tears or incomplete repairs? Yeah, this is a, a hot topic right now because uh, the indications for platelet rich plasma, which is PRP and stem cells, the, the indications are very up in the air right now. We don't really know what it works for and what it doesn't work for. So uh, people are injecting this into a lot of things to see if it helps. There are a lot of studies on the shoulder, however, um, looking at stem cell injections into the shoulder, and they're very inconclusive as to whether or not they provide any benefit. 
So I can speak for me in my practice, I do not use stem cell injections in the shoulder. Um, they, the, the thought behind them is that they stimulate a healing response, but there's some limiting factors in the shoulder in that you know, the shoulder doesn't have very good blood supply to start. And a lot of these tears are very chronic. So it, it's very, it, you know, again, I don't use the PRP in the shoulder. It has uses in different parts of the body, but I've found, uh, you know, less than satisfying results in the shoulder. Um, they've tested it at the time of surgery too. You know, again, healing is an issue. So there have been many studies on testing stem cell injections at the time of surgery to maybe stimulate a healing response. And those, to my knowledge, have all found uh, equivocal results, nothing no, no benefit, no significant benefit. So again, I, I'm not anti-PRP for everything, but I, I, I'm not sure that it has uh, a lot of proven benefit in the shoulder. But again, everybody's tear and situation is a little bit different. Thank you. When the rotator cuff is injured, do other shoulder muscles take over? And what possible problems occur if this happens? Yeah, there's a lot of compensation. That's a good question. And that's a, a big part of how this starts is somebody will strain a muscle carrying their groceries. And then six months later, they'll have a rotator cuff problem because they strained a little muscle and then that caused another muscle to have to overwork and then another muscle overworked. And next thing you know, their posture changed a little bit, not, not necessarily like radically changed, but just a subtle change in their scapula posture. And the next thing you know, they have a rotator cuff problem. So there's a huge link between all these muscles together. That's why it's important to take care of these problems before they get out of control. Um, also a common thing we see is the, the neck. A lot of people have neck issues coming from the shoulder. And the reason I give for that is, you know, if you have a good shoulder and you use your shoulder normally, then that, everything's wonderful. But if your shoulder starts to hurt, you compensate by doing a lot of this. You start reaching for things and using your neck and your scapula more instead of just doing simply shoulder exercise or mo movements. And so next thing you know, somebody's got neck pain and then vice versa. You can have a neck problem that starts to spread to the shoulder. So there absolutely is a huge, a huge problem with this. And that's why, again, I say, don't wait until problems get out of control to address them. Thank you. After I have rotator cuff surgery, do I have to sleep in a recliner or can I sleep in a bed? Uh, you can sleep however you want to sleep. It's recliners get attention because um, it's either the recliner people pushing this or uh, it just feels comfortable. It, it's more comfortable when you have a shoulder injury to kind of get kind of mushed in and padded around. And, and, and sometimes it's just easier to do that in a recliner or laying on a couch. Um, but it's not for necessarily safety reasons. It's just comfort because as you're going to see, if you're supposed to have surgery anytime soon, you'll find out it's, it's miserable. It's hard to sleep. And after a week or two of not really sleeping through the night, it gets, it gets tough. So people do anything they can to sleep. So recliners have become popular, but I would not go out and buy a recliner before surgery. If you don't have one in your house already, I'm sure you can find ways to do it with pillows too. Thank you. Someone says that they were diagnosed with a rotator cuff tear about 15 years ago and did not seek treatment at the time. Now they're over 80 years old and it's bad. Can it be treated? It definitely can. You know, in an over 80 year old person, I would exhaust the shots. I would exhaust the physical therapy. I would exhaust, you know, chiropractic, massage therapy. I, I definitely, I'd go the distance with everything I could. Um, and if they still were totally unbearable in unbearable pain and just unhappy, their quality of life wasn't good, we do have surgical options. So in an 80 year old and up, you know, I probably would stay away from the graft surgeries. Um, those take a lot of effort to get them to heal. So the grafts would probably go out. At that point, you'd be looking more at either uh, a, a shoulder replacement or a, a balloon. But again, the balloons are very new. And the balloons just help with the pain. They don't really give you much function, but they can help alleviate some of the pain. Um, but it's not a forever treatment. So the, the shoulder replacement, the reverse shoulder replacement is probably the better option in a patient like that. But again, it, it depends on your health and your ability to recover from surgery. But they're apt to answer your question though, there are options. Absolutely, there are options. Thank you. Could rotator cuff injuries cause neuropathy in your arms? They can, yes. A lot of people that I see, if I ask them, I'm seeing them for a very obvious clear shoulder problem, 
And then I ask, well, do you get any numbness or tingling in your hands? And a surprisingly large amount of people do. And uh, there are lots of, lots of possibilities for that. One is when you get a bad shoulder, you start to use your neck muscles more, which then can strain your neck muscles and cause some nerve symptoms. Number two is when you have a bad shoulder, a lot of people have slouchy posture. When the shoulder starts to hurt, what do you do? You, you get lazy with it and you let it slouch, which can stretch the brachial plexus and the nerves, which can cause nerve symptoms. And then thirdly, when you have a bad shoulder, you just use your arm differently. If, if you've been using your arm the same way for 40 or 50 years and suddenly you're using the arm differently, it's very possible you can strain and overuse the nerves in a different way and start to get nerve symptoms. Thank you. After a rotator cuff repair, how long will the pain last? Will mild pain persist long term? Uh, that is such a, a difficult question to ask or to answer because everybody's so different. Some people come back three weeks out and are already doing great, um, totally off all the medicines, loving life. Um, I, we've had people swinging a golf club at six weeks completely against my wishes. Um, and then you have other people that, uh, you know, after six months still can't reach up above their shoulder. I mean, it's unbelievable how variable the results are. You do the same surgery in 10 people and you can get such variability in the results. And a lot of that has to do with, uh, uh their pain tolerance going in their expectations going in expectations are hugely important. If people think it's going to be a, a breeze and a walk in the park, you can guarantee they're going to have problems. Um, and then their therapy, people have to be diligent about going to therapy, but it, this is something that we see second opinions for people will come and they think there must be something wrong. I shouldn't be hurting like this after three months, there must be something wrong. The doctor must have messed up. Nope. I mean, that's very run of the mill. I mean, that's very, you know, unfortunately that's, that's the, that's the nature of this injury is it just, it can hurt, but most people are off the pain medicine after two or three weeks though. So we love to get people off the strong stuff and onto the, the, the less potent medications. Thank you. If physical therapy seems to help and you can do daily activities with your arm, what's the chance of the pain returning if you had a moderate tear? Well, it's probably very good. Um, just like any damaged good in your body, which we all have a lot. If we MRI our whole body, we find damaged areas all over. You learn to manage it. You learn to live with it. So. If you know you have a rotator cuff injury, a, a partial tear, um, you want to be doing your exercises every day or so. You want to be using good posture. And if you lift something too heavy or you, you do some exercise that flares it up, you, you, you know what exercises to do to get out of that hole. You take some Advil, take some ibuprofen, maybe you know get back in touch with your massage therapist or your physical therapist or chiropractor. You know, Stay on top of it. Um, but these are management problems, you know, with any shoulder, even after surgery, people will have flare ups from time to time. So you have to just learn a lot about it. That's why I like to draw these pictures so that people understand the problem and they don't just feel like they're being told to go do this. They understand why am I sending them to therapy? Oh, because it fixes the posture because then they'll think they'll be better about it. So you have to learn how to manage these problems going forward. Thank you. What exercises are recommended to help prevent your rotator cuff from uh, getting inflamed or, or having issues due to aging? Sure. Um, again, it's going to be mostly your scapular muscles, the, 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 the shoulder blade muscles. So you're going to want to do shoulder shrugs where you lift your shoulders up. You want to do some sort of a, a rowing machine, but not so much, you know, the arm part is important, but probably the most important is the actual like pinching of your, your shoulder blades. So you can do a little row, but make sure you pinch that shoulder blade at the back. Um, postural exercises, like pulling the shoulders out and back, pulling the shoulders down. So if you have a, 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 you know, a pull down machine, a lat pull machine or a pull up bar type thing, you wanna pull and strengthen the scapular muscles. It, it, that's mostly what you wanna do. Uh, I'm not saying strengthening the chest and the front muscles is bad, but that, that you want to always balance the body, but, but I'd, I'd focus more on the, the, the traps, the rhomboids, things in the back, things that pull your uh, chest out and shoulders back. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Avery. That's all the time we have today.
If you asked a question and we did not have a chance to answer it, we will answer it later in the comments. Dr. Right. Avery, would you like to close? Uh, thank you for having me. Have a great week.